meeting is being recorded. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, from the seminars in the Master in Quantum Community Technology from the University, uh, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. So now, uh, today, we are having with us Daniel Perez. Daniel is a regular speaker in these in the seminars, and he's an inter, uh, sorry, an experimental physicist. He's specialized in quantum computing, and he graduated in physics from the Complutense University in Madrid. And he got his uh, PhD at KU11. I hope I got that uh, right in Belgium. And he researched the properties of nanoscale superconducting materials. At the moment, he's a postdoctoral researcher in IMEC in Belgium as well. And he's developing materials and fabrication processes to make quantum technology fabrication compatible with the industrial tools and techniques. And before that, he participated as well in the project uh, Open SuperCube, where, where he designed and fabricated different quantum processors uh, prototypes with the goal of having a quantum computer for Europe. So with that said, thank you, Daniel, for joining us to, uh, to share your experience uh, with us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I hope you like the presentation. So over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and having me again in this uh, series of seminars. Um, so I guess a little bit about me. I'm, um, well, I was introduced already, but a little bit uh, like how I'm moving around Europe. I'm a, currently a postdoctoral researcher and in IMEC in Belgium. And uh, before I also was a postdoc, a postdoctoral researcher in, in, in Gothenburg in Sweden. And that, that is basically where I got all the expertise in quantum computing. Because before when I did my, my PhD, it was only about superconducting materials. And then it was a nice transition to shift to uh, quantum computing based on superconducting materials because I could use uh, what I learned, what I developed in my PSD to, to make uh, some applications. And uh, a little bit about the, um, the place I work. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, IMEC. It's uh, an RD hub for nano digital technologies in Belgium. It's um, basically what you can do, see here is our like uh, site. It's a public research institute, so it's similar to CSIC in in Spain, but this is uh, has been focused on creating uh, industrial clean rooms so we can fabricate uh, nanotechnologies based on silicon. And um, what you see in the picture, basically, we have a two, 200 millimeter wafer fabrication facility that is an old facility. Then we have a newer one where we can fabricate 300 millimeter wafer facility and the tower you see just the, the offices where everyone uh, sits. And then for some of you who are not familiar with this, what is a 300 millimeter wafer or 200 millimeter wafer? So here you can see an example of what is a 100 millimeter wafer. So we work with, with these sizes. This uh, disc is entirely made of silicon. And then on top, you deposit other metals and you pattern microchips or, uh, or whatever you want to fabricate. And in this, uh, the, the small rectangles you can see are dies. So each of them is, let's say, an individual chip. And probably for this one, it contains this specific sample, millions and millions of transistors. But this is the, this is the, basically the typical size of a 300 millimeter, millimeter wafer. And the benefits of that is like in these facilities, since we work with these sizes, there are the sizes that the companies, um, they also use for fabrication of microprocessors for regular computers. So this means whatever process we develop in our facilities can be immediately put in the production line of uh, uh, companies like Intel or TMSNC, which is another uh, big foundry that uh, fabricates things. So that is why it's important to have this in Europe and in Belgium, because we can directly move from um, from the, the prototype we, desi we design, immediately put it in the, in the, to the production lines. Um, in IMEC, there is a lot of research, but we have three lines for quantum computing. We are developing silicon spin qubits. We are developing superconductor qubits. And also recently, we started developing photon qubits. Uh, we, uh, the, these two programs are internal, are internal research of IMEC. And the photonic qubits is a partnership we have with a Canadian company called Sanadu. So now let's move into a little bit into the history of quantum computing and where we are located now on time. So um, typically, if you check back uh, in the past, when quantum computing started, uh, you can just yeah, track it back to the 80s. But in the 80s, the first quantum, uh, quantum mechanical model for a 
a computer was given. And since that happened, until like the first, let's say, uh, experimental implementation happened, it took 15 years. So this is what I normally call the quantum computing as an idea. In the, in the meanwhile, in all these 15 years period, there were uh, many ideas developing, such as, uh, for instance, is when Shor uh, developed his famous algorithm. Also, he developed error correcting codes for quantum computing. So there was a lot of happening back in the theory, but nothing. there was no physical realization until 1995 that the, the first quantum gate uh, was, uh, was implemented, was a thinot using trap ions. Then let's say the next, for me, the next uh, uh, landmark or important point in 2014 is when the University of Santa Barbara, the group of John Martinis, uh, joins Google. Until that period, Everything that happened in, quantum, in the quantum computing community was done in research lab at the university. So were research groups, let's say with 10, 20 people, and they were fabricating these devices and testing, developing everything in, a, in their lab, in, a, the most, in, the, in their small lab, everything in an academic context. And then once a, the group of John Martinez from the University of Santa Barbara, they joined Google, from that point, more companies st or start acquiring groups. For instance, um, also IBM started getting interested in quantum computing and is where they contacted Jay Gambetta and they started uh, uh, the, the, to work with IBM. Then some years later, IonQ was founded and up to now, basically, uh, that there are many companies dedicated to quantum computing, both in software and hardware. And, and yeah, let's say, and then now another important point uh, that I consider is in 2018 when the experiment from Google on quantum supremacy was demonstrated that um, a, a piece of a like, quantum processor uh, made a calculation that was out of reach at the time uh, to the most powerful supercomputer. This is now, um, there have been several papers and, and experiments that has have beaten that record in the sense of with classical computation they have reproduced easily the results from google but back on the time what was the, was demonstrated it was impossible so then now today we're in uh, um, 2022 and basically we are in the middle of what is called nisc era nisc is a it stands for a noise intermediate scale quantum this means that right now we have quantum processor which are in the around 50 to 100 qubits, and they are noisy. This means there is no error correction. In the devices we have now, we have in the labs, Google, IBM, IonQ, they have in the lab, they, they don't implement quantum, uh, quantum error correction. This means that all the calculations they run in those processors, they, are, uh, they, they will suffer errors due to the physical nature of the process. Um, of course, the goal for quantum computing is fault tolerant era let's say once we have um, uh, quantum processors that uh, where qu um, quantum co error correction has been implemented so all the calculations we we compute and we perform are error corrected so the um, the probability of getting the right uh, answer is uh, high because in the moment we are now with the quantum processors we have typically you do um, thousand operations, thousand, you run thousand quantum gates or two qubit quantum gates, and then your the probability of getting a, the correct answer is really, really low. So we want to overcome that and to be able to correct for this. And every time you do a calculation, is, is the correct one. When this will happen, the fault tolerant era, um, there, is, there are many projections or roadmaps that say, okay, by 2030, this will happen. The roadmap of Google, IBM, IonQ, uh, side quantum so different companies they have this as, a, as a, by the end of this decade as a goal to have a fault tolerant uh, quantum corrected uh, computer but we'll see how the experiments develop what we can talk right now is about the um, what we need to build a quantum computer and for this uh, divisenso uh, made a, a series of points that typically is the like a, a guideline you you need to follow you want to make a quantum computer implementing whatever whatever physical implementation it doesn't matter if it's supercontent qubits ion traps neutral, uh, neutral atoms uh, photonics it doesn't matter what it is but you need to 
to be able to build a quantum computer, you need to have the following uh, elements. So you need a scalable system containing well-characterized qubits. This means that uh, whatever the physical implementation you do, you need to be able to make 100,000 or at least half a plan to how to make 1,000 qubits or 1 million qubits. Because if you develop a type of qubit, but you cannot make, it's impossible physically to make more than 10, uh, it's going to be, yeah, you will not be able to make a, a quantum computer that can compute things that are considered useful. Then you also need to be able to initialize the qubits. So um, this is very important because when you start executing your algorithm, you need to have your uh, inici the initialization and you need to be able to put the qubits if you want in the state one or in the state zero. Uh, or, um, th and this is very important because there are some implementations like for instance with um, molecules that this is not completely possible to initialize uh, the qubits uh, to the desired state. Another important feature is like the decoherence time. It has to be much larger than the gate time. Um, this is, we're working with quantum systems and they are really fragile in the sense if they interact with the environment, they lose their quantumness. This means that the phase becomes random and then you cannot do whatever you want to do. Um, so this decoherence time has to be much larger than the time it takes for you to apply your quantum gates. Because if it is equivalent, by the time you finish applying your quantum gate, uh, you will lose track of the states of your qubit. Then you need a universal set of quantum gates. Of course, to do universal computation, you need to, to have this. So whatever system you have, you need to be able to show that you have a universal set of quantum gates. Uh, a universal set of quantum gates is, for instance, single qubit gates and a C0 gate. Uh, with this, those two, with single qubit rotations, plus the CNOT gate, you can implement um, uh, whatever uh, gate you're interested in by combining those two. And then you need, be, you need to be able to, to measure the state of the qubit. Of course, once you have done your computation, if you are not able to measure how your qubit finish, you will not be able to retrieve uh, your results and then it will be useless. Then the... Um, the scheme or the conceptual yeah, the conceptual map for implementing a fault tolerant quantum computing it has mainly two layers one is the physical layers which is the physical elements that uh, forms the computer and the qubits so then you have the um, your physical quantum processor that then you connect uh, your control lines and your reader lines and then based on that with all this element what you make is logical qubits. Um, using many physical qubits, you can make one uh, logical qubit. There is a ratio normally depending on the on the method methodology and the codes you are using, the recorrecting codes. You need more or less physical qubit to implement a logical qubit. But in principle, the logical qubit it has an error rate much smaller than the physical qubits. That's why you want to build a logical qubit. And then when you have many, you are able in your physical processor to build many logical qubits, you, you use those logical qubits to make the calculations you want. Because using those logical qubits, the error rate will be very low. And then basically after that, the computation, you just read out your log logical qubit, you decode the state, and then you are able to run quantum algorithms with a really low error rate. So now let's move to the landscape of physical implementation of um, qubit systems and companies that are developing this. Uh, this is, has grown a lot compared to the last two years. And by the way, this is um, um, a cartoon made by Dominic Wildman. Uh, he has a YouTube ch uh, channel and then he has, a made, he has made a video about it and it's, it's quite great and it's quite well summarized. So basically the different implementations for uh, implementing qubits and quantum processor, we have uh, superconducting, qu uh, superconducting quantum computers that are based on, you, you use superconducting materials to make uh, electrical circuits and these circuits behave like individual atoms that are qubits. And you have a lot of companies, you have IBM, Google, you have Intel, you have QTEC, Rigetti Computing, the um, UST of China, uh, Alibaba, which is uh, the, company that has AliExpress, IQM, Amazon. There are many, many companies and 
each of them they have different quantum processor with a different um, numbers of uh, qubit count. Then you have um, another implementation is linear optical quantum computers. This is also called photonic quantum computing. And you have different companies like Sai Quantum, Sanadu, or uh, also the University of Technology in China. Um, you have quantum uh, computers that this is typically made on silicon spin qubits. So basically you make a circuit to make one thing which is quantum dot and the quantum dot behaves as a qubit. And then there are also many institutes and companies working on that. You have Dell University, QTech, uh, Intel, uh, Cialetti, which is in France, uh, IMEC, we are also working on that. Then you have the other famous uh, technological implementation is Trap Ions, and there is uh, several companies that are working on that, Honeywell, IonQ, Alpine Quantum Technologies. Then you have uh, Color Center Quantum Computers, um, this is a well-known alternative and typically you use uh, nitrogen vacancy in, uh, vacancies in diamonds and this is not that well developed for quantum computing but these qubits are, are great sensors because they work at room temperature and they are very very sensible then you have uh, neutral atoms in optical lattice this implementation is very very similar to uh, trap ions but instead of using in trap ions you use electromagnetic waves and traps to to make the ions stay and use those as qubits in here in neutral atoms you use you use optical tweezers that is called and they, you can move and shuffle ions around there are also several companies that have a large number of qubit count then you have topological quantum computers um or topological qubits there you have also several uh, groups researching on this but this is important to to mention it, like no one has ever demonstrated uh, a topological qubit. In principle, they are great because they are intrinsically protected against noise. So they should have really long coherence times, but no one has been able to, to show one. And then finally, there is um, a really recent implementation that is you, you use liquid helium and you put electrons on top like floating on the liquid helium and with that you can also make quantum computing quantum computers there is a, a company and yeah so far they have reached one qubit but this is as i said is very very new it's maybe the idea is old but the implementation maybe it's two years uh, that has been so let's now focus a little bit on on super on, on some of the main or the let's, let's say the most promising uh, implementations for quantum computers so the one of the most famous or more, most promising is superconducting circuits. So here, what you can see is a picture of the first superconducting qubit that was invented in 1999. And basically, this is a, a micrograph. So the, the bar scale you can see is one micron. It's, it's very small. And basically, this is uh, uh, aluminum. You pattern, uh, you take an aluminum film and you pattern the circuit, and this works as a qubit. And then let's say 20 years later, after that, we have already a quantum processor with 53 qubits, which is Sycamore from Google. So it's a, a huge leap from in 20 years only. Then, <clears throat> if let's say we open this quantum processor and we take a look inside, what we see is this one. In these pictures, you can see different elements. You can see the crosses, which are the qubits. <coughs> Sorry. Then in green, you can see a line that is a cap coupler. This is used, that line is used to make the qubits, the red crosses, to talk to each other. So this is the way you can implement two qubit gates by modulating the interaction between the, the two qubits. And then you have the blue lines, which are the readout resonators. You use those for reading in which state the qubit is, if it is in zero or it is in one. And then you can zoom in a little bit more. And then at the top of the cross, you have this, which is called a squid or uh, just some junction. And this is what gives the, the qubit is, let's say its properties, it is magic because it gives, um, let's say a non-linearity to this electrical circuit. And thanks to that, you can, you can have different energy levels in your system. <coughs> okay. 
And then these superconducting circuits, uh, you can they can be made of, of different materials. Uh, typically, there are use of, there are made of aluminum, tantalum, or niobium. For instance, Google uses aluminum for uh, his superconducting circuits. IBM uses niobium. This just some junctions. Everyone uses aluminum for making them. And now there is a, last year there was a breakthrough uh, with material characterization and. Um, there is a group in Princeton that they show that if you use tantalum instead of aluminum to make the circuits, the coherence time you can multiply by three. So instead of, for instance, now IBM has a typical coherence time of 100 microseconds. If you use tantalum, you can move to 300 microseconds or even 500 microseconds, which is a, a huge improvement. Then the typical lab that uh, where you has all the, have all the this infrastructure, all the electronics, all the crystal looks exactly like this. This is a cartoon, but uh, you will see um, now that is a really, really <laughs> a good cartoon. So first of all, we need a control computer. We need a classical computer to control all the electronics uh, and to be able to manipulate the, the quantum processor. Then we have the electronics rack. So as I say, this is, is it looks literally like in the in the picture. So what you have is different electronic elements, which are needed for manipulating the qubits. Um, so you have arbitrary wave generators. You have, um, so as I was saying, arbitrary wave generation, RF sources. Um, you have modulators. You have mixers. A lot of uh, circuitry that it goes outside the fridge. Then you have the fridge that. This picture is really famous. You probably have seen it everywhere. This is what a dilution refrigerator looks like. Um, uh, it is needed to put the superconducting qubits because you need to cool them to really, really low temperatures so they work as, as qubits. Um, unfortunately, if you even if you you need to cool them down to that temperature, otherwise they don't work. It's, uh, you cannot make this type of qubits and they work at one Kelvin, let's say or at 4 Kelvin. You need to cool them down to really 10 millikelvin. So all the lines you see there are cables that they, what they do, they, they send the pulses that these electronics uh, send. They transmit the pulses through the cryostat. And then there are amplifiers. And in this can that you see there is where you host the quantum processor. These cryostats have different parts. The, the first part is the 50 Kelvin stage. Then you have um, another stage, which is at a lower temperature, only 4 Kelvin. Then you go to 0 0.8 Kelvin and then uh, 0 0.01 Kelvin. So just to, you have a reference. This is 100 times colder than intergalactic space. The temperature, the outer, outer space is um, 2 Kelvins approximately, or 3 Kelvins approximately. So in the, at the bottom of the cryostats that host superconducting quantum processors, this temperature is 100 times colder. And then if you just open the can and then you take a look how a, a quantum processor looks like, it looks like something like this. So you can see the elements we have seen before in the previous slide. So you can have you, you have the crosses, and then you have also the reader resonator, this meandering. This is not a well, this you technically is a quantum processor, but with only one qubit because this is a, a, a test chip we use when we make um, new a new design. And uh, we implement a new process with new materials or new cleaning, cleaning treatments or whatever we have modified through the previous version. We have these test chips. So we test the performance of the qubits before making a, a larger a larger quantum processor. Then and now we can take a look at the most powerful, let's say, um, superconducting quantum processors that are uh, there from different companies. So one of them is Sycamore uh, from Google. Uh, so far, they managed to implement uh, 54 qubits. Then the qubits they use, they have a coherence time of uh, 15 microseconds. Then they are able to, the time it takes for them to implement a one qubit gate is only 25 nanoseconds. The two qubit gates are even, even faster, it's only 12 nanoseconds. The error they have when they implement a one qubit gate is only 0.16%. And the error they implement when they, when the error they get when they implement a two qubit gate is 0.93%. 
these errors are quite slow, but they are still not enough to implement uh, quantum error correction. Ideally, you want to have the two qubit error gate to go down to 0.1%. And from that threshold, you can already start implementing a quantum error correction codes. And also another important error you get is the readout error. Um, it's much higher than the rest, but this is, um, we shouldn't panic about this because the readout error uh, for every quantum quantum gates, when you are performing an algorithm, when you are executing an algorithm, quantum gates, you, you, you run a lot of quantum gates, but the readout, you only do it once per uh, run, let's say. So it doesn't matter if the error is higher here, because you only do one of these operations. In other, I mean, when you're running an algorithm, so two qubit gates or one qubit gate, you, you do hundred or thousand. Then you, we have Eagle from IBM. This is the its latest uh, quantum processor. It has 127 qubits. Uh, it has the qubit. It has a coherence time of 96 microseconds. The um, the gate speed for one qubit gates, I wasn't able to find it, but I was able to find the, the two qubit gate. Uh, time is uh, 50, uh, 550 nanoseconds. It's much, um, much longer than Google, but it's also because depending on the design you have, uh, you have different speeds for the gates you can implement. It's all, it's, at the end, it's all down to the to your design. Then the, um, the one qubit gate error is 0.3. And the two qubit gate error rate is quite high, 6.5. But uh, we have to remember this is the large, largest superconducting quantum processor that uh, is right now. So it's, it's a really, uh, a really technical achievement because if we compare to Sycamore, Sycamore has only two layers, uh, um, and this Eagle has four layers between qubits, radar resonators, control lines. It's uh, it's quite it's quite it's quite awesome they have managed to, to fabricate this. So as, as time passes, they will be able to, they will learn, IBM will learn uh, why this uh, processor behaves like this and they will implement it. But just the fact that you have so many qubits is, um, is, a, is a big achievement. Then we have Aspen M from Rigetti. Um, they, they managed to implement 80 qubits. Um, I wasn't able to find any data about the performance. I know it's available for the uh, customers, but I, I couldn't I couldn't find any data from error gates, coherence times, etc. Et One particularity they do is like it's a modular design. So um, it's similar to the wool design. So the two chips, one on top, one on the bottom. But you can see the top chip is like modular. It has like four stripes. So what they do basically is they first they fabricate the bottom chip and then they, they fabricate four individual chips that they, let's say, stick together on top of each other. And finally, we have uh, Su Chongxi uh, from University, Technical University of China. Um, this is a, a quantum processor that has 66 qubits and the architecture wise is a copy of Sycamore. Actually, the paper they, they made describing this processor, they exactly ran the same experiment that Google ran. So you can consider this as a copy of uh, Sycamore. Although the metrics they have are uh, slightly worse. For instance, the coherence time is only 4.3 microseconds. The gate times are also uh, higher. Uh, the, though the error rates are, are quite similar. So these are right now the four more, let's say the, the four biggest systems for superconducting quantum circuit that uh, there are out there. And then um, we can have a timeline of these companies and what they propose. So it's the only, well, there, I just summarized these three companies. So um, Google, that they have a timeline, but they don't mention, they mention uh, milestones, but they don't mention by which time they want to achieve those milestones. The only thing they say by uh, the end of the decade, they want to have 1 million physical qubits. Um, then IBM, they are a little more concise. Um, for this year, they have already promised 433 qubits. So probably if this happens, it will happen at the end towards December or so. Then by next year, they promise to break the 1,000 qubit barrier. And then after that, they haven't promised anything yet. But 
also they promise by the end of the decade to have one million physical qubits. Then uh, Origin Quantum, which is let's say a company that was founded by China, by the University of Southern Technology China. For this year, they have promised also 144 qubits. And for 2044, they also they have promised to break the barrier of 1000 qubits. So this is the roadmaps they have. Let's see how they deliver. So far, IBM, they are on track because if you take the, 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 roadmap, the roadmap they have defined, already they are fulfilling their schedule up to, yeah, up to now. So let's wait until the end of the year if they, they can, let's say, multiply by almost four the qubit count. And some of the challenges <clears throat> that the superconducting quantum circuits they need to face is um, the re reduction in the error rates. So as, as I mentioned before, we need to go to, to errors of 0.1% in the two qubit gates. If we, we want to implement a quantum error correction in a scalable manner and also electronic miniaturization. So here to, to give you a sense of why, of, give you a notion of why electronic miniaturization is needed. This is uh, the, all the cables you see are the cables that are needed to connect um, Sycamore processor, which has only four, uh, 54 qubits. So you can see the, the enormous amount of cables that need to be connected. So of course, if you want to scale to 1 million qubits, this is not this is not scalable. So there is a research and efforts need to be put on having this, all these electronics in the chip or inside the refrigerator. And also another uh, problem with the sizes is like, you can see the size of the cryostat that you can fit people actually inside the cryostat. The regular cryostats we use in, in labs for testing qubits is, yeah, is uh, the size of a fridge, of the fridge you can have at home. So now IBM for their systems, they, they just commission a special one and you can see it's, it's, it's enormous. So there are, for superconducting qubits, to go to the path of 1 million physical qubits, there is uh, some issues that need to be resolved and we will see in the next year uh, what happened. Now let's move to ion traps, which is other of the, other of the leading technologies uh, in the quantum computing field. Uh, these ion traps, the concept is basically you have ions, which are charged atoms. They are stored in electromagnetic traps. And then you can manipulate those ions by using microwaves or lasers. And by using this, uh, by manipulating them, you can make these atoms, in th these ions interact. And then you can implement one qubit gate or two qubit gates. So basically, this is one of the chips that is used because now you can, in the past, these atom, these traps used to be bulky, quite big. Now uh, the technology has been improved, and now we can make chips actually that uh, they can uh, that serve as uh, traps. And uh, just a scheme of how this looks like: these chips, planar traps. Basically, you have um, uh, RF uh, electrodes, and then the the ions, which is this blue ball. Is just floating on top and then by manipulating this rf uh, electrodes and uh, modulating the voltage and with the lasers you can you can move the ions you can make them interact so that is the principle behind so this this is how system the system looks like it's much more modular so actually these two racks that are also the size of, a, of the fridge you can have a phone they host an entire quantum computer so this is the prototype, uh, one prototype that uh, one company which called Alpine Quantum Technology has uh, developed. And if you take a look at, at each of these racks, you can see what they have inside. So they have everything. You have the control electronics, the lasers, um, and then, so this is the optic racks, which is called, and then the trap rack that they have all the elements you need. You have the traps inside, the DC traps, the RF traps, the amplifiers, the reading out, etc. And then basically, if you open these racks, you will find the images you have on the right. So you can see the designs are quite compact. It's nothing bulky. And this is a, actually in this model is a 24 ions quantum computer. So this is the size more or less it, it takes. Of course, some other, uh, this company, Alpine Quantum Technologies, they have take uh, a big effort to make it really modular and really compact. 
typically uh, these compute i mean these systems are larger and you need an optical table with lasers and uh, more things but um, companies will push to have every every time more modular designs if, if they are possible then let's now take a look to the let's say the biggest system that are uh, in the market for ion traps we have the 30q system from ion q and this is uh, the chips the the chip they use so they have um, 32 qubits available but um, they cannot perform two qubit gates <coughs> between all of them they can only perform perform two qubit gates with 11 of them they have a linear architecture this means that the, the ions in this trap are all sit in a line and they can they can make them move them and make it interact them only in the line um, ion traps they use uh, different let's say different physical implementations even all of them are ions you can encode the, your qubit in different different um how to say different um, levels or different structures in your in your ion so here they use something called hyperfi transitions to define their qubit levels yeah sorry and, i have a question ah uh, yeah uh, what is mean by AOM amplifier in your previous slide? Uh, um, what are we? Ah, these ones are amplifiers for the for the optics because it's um, you need to the, the way you you read out the state of the of the ion traps is because they emit uh, photons in the visible spectrum. So you need to you need to amplify the let's say amplify the signal of the detectors that detect those, those that light because you, you you need to realize you are detecting one photon only. Well, so you cannot measure. Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, I don't know what it stands for actually, but I know they I mean the amplifiers you use them to amplify the signal the, of the readout, but I don't know what it, what it stands for. Okay, thank you. Um, then the, the this this chip they have one percent in one qu uh, one qubit uh, one qubit gate and error of two, higher than two percent in, in in two qubit gates. So this they, they still need to be improved. They want to implement quantum error correction or start implementing quantum error correction of these systems. Then we have. Uh, Alpine Quattro Technologies, they have a processor, what is called Pine, that actually is the processor that, that goes in the rack I saw before. I couldn't find a picture, uh, a physical picture, like the one from IonQ, but the trap they have is a more classical one. It's not in a chip, but it's something that looks like this. And then they also put all their uh, ions in a line, but instead of using hyperfire transitions in their ions, they use, they use optical transitions to define the qubit. And they have quite good uh, error rates, but still they, they are above the 0 0.1 threshold percent. So this uh, still needs to be improved. And they, they managed to they managed to make system with 24 qubits. And then finally, you have um, H1 system from Honeywell that has um, 10 qubits, but the architecture is different. So instead of having a, a linear, I mean, <clears throat> it's still linear, but they are they are able to move the qubits out of plane. So if it was like a two-dimensional grid. In the future, they have plans to make like a, a full connected to the grid, to the grid, so they can shuffle all the ions and make them cross and move around like a circuit, like a track. But so far, they, they still use the linear uh, configuration, but they can move the, the, the qubit, the, let's say the ions f backward and forward. They also use this qubit. They define it the hyperfine transitions, and then the the one qubit terror gate they have is very good. Actually, is uh, below the one percent uh, threshold, but the two qubit gate is still is still bad. Well, I mean, is zero point eight percent. And one of the Let's say one of the features of the ion traps, what they are very good is because they have all-to-all uh, -all connectivity. So this means it doesn't matter that you have the 
ions in a line, they are a linear array, you can make every ion in the system interact with whatever other ion you want. And the, these things, they have benefits for when you want to implement error correction codes. Because if you have a higher connectivity, you can implement a more uh, like a higher variety of error correction codes that compared to superconducting qubits that they just have a near neighbor connectivity. So in superconducting qubits, you just can make the qubits to talk to the qubits they have immediately next to them. On the one of the drawback actually they have is the the gate time, the, the time it takes to implement a, a gate is, is quite slow. It's in the order of microseconds. While if you compare to superconducting qubits, in superconducting qubits, we are talking about hundreds of nanoseconds. So it's still like 100 times faster. So if we have make a, we can also make a similar table, a comparison with, um, like we did with superconducting qubits, and let's say with these three companies, IonQ, uh, they have promised for this year to have 25 qubits for physical qubits, then for 2023, 400, 24, uh, 470, and then 25, uh, break the 1,000 qubit barrier. And then by 2027, they won't fall tolerant. That this implies 1 million physical qubits. If you go and check the roadmap, they define algorithmic. Instead of physical qubit, they, they mention something that is, that is algorithmic qubits. And then they have a calculator that you can use to, to translate algorithmic qubits into physical qubits. But physically, um, roughly, this is the, the order of magnitude. In Alpine Quantum Technologies, uh, they don't mention anything about the road. They don't have, in the, even in their website, they don't have a roadmap. They, they don't, of course, they want to keep improving, but they don't have information on how they want to do, what they want to move forward. Uh, Honeywell, also, they, they have um, a roadmap. They don't talk. Uh, about the, the amount of qubits either. They just talk about new systems. So all of them are called H1, H2, H3. And they want the only goal that they have clear is they want to get full tolerant by also by the end of the decade. And in these different systems they, uh, they have and they want to implement is basically updates in the modularity. They want to have uh, like two degrees. And then when once they have designed the one two degree, they want to make many two degrees, and they, they they want to couple all of them together, and then you can move all the ions and the qubits around. And um, the challenges this technology has is they need to uh, reduce the the error. Um, one interesting also feature of this uh, ion trap is that the errors they have is all due to the electronics. The, the qubits they have because they are atoms. Or they are ions. They are, uh, let's say, perfect qubits. They they really live for a long time, and because they cannot interact with anything else, so they don't they cannot lose their quantumness, let's say. And um, this made them perfect, but the control of these qubits and interactions, this is what is uh, failing. So that, that is why you see, um, let's say the 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 error rates they have are all higher. Because they need to improve in the in the control, in the laser control, in the uh, electronics control. They also, if if, if possible, they they have to in, try to increase the gate the they need to reduce the gate speed. So sorry, I think I yeah I wrote it incorrectly. They need to improve the speed of the gates because right now they are too slow. Because uh, if you want to implement error corrections, then there is a overhead that you need to take into account. And typically the overhead is 100 times your gate time. So if now it takes you about, let's say 10 microseconds to implement a gate, a gate then if you take into account the overhead, it will be like 1000 microseconds or so 1 milliseconds uh, that it will be too slow every time you want to implement a logical gate. And also, yeah, a little bit they need to implement the control. So they, they, they the leading architecture here, they propose to move um, ions around the system. So they need to be very, very, they need to control the motion of these uh, ions uh, very precisely. So now let's move um, to other of the technologies that has emerged in the last, let's say, two, three years as a very robust candidate uh, is photonics. So using photons for, um, for doing quantum calculations. This scheme is, it has many advantages. It's highly scalable. 
because you just need photons. So as, as, as long as you are able to produce a lot of photons and you can manipulate the quantum state of the photon, you need anything else. Um, it works at room temperature, so you need you don't need cryostats like the one we have seen for superconducting. We need this huge uh, cryostat to cool down the qubits. Also for the ion traps, the, your ion trap need, needs to be in a in a cryostat, so you reduce the pressure at uh, maximum and you release you you diminish the probability of air molecules interfering in your system. And also another particularity of the photonics is the um, Ion, ions and uh, superconducting qubits, they follow the gate model, the gate model for quantum computing. Um, photonics, they follow the cluster state computing model. So it's, it works, it's equivalent, but it works in a different way. So then one of the, let's say, one of the yeah, biggest processors is USAN.2. <coughs> and this is the, basically, this is the quantum computer. It's a huge optical table with many, many elements. And they, they have been able to detect up to 113 modes, which we'll say is like having 113 qubits. But of course, this was only this was designed only to prove that the, the distributions of calculate or the, let's say the one that you run boson sample, the boson sampling experiment, um, you can outperform any computer. Because of course, this if you want to, you have to build a photonic quantum computer. With a million qubits and you have this kind of setup, it's, yeah, it's, it's not practical, it's not scalable. That's why many companies have moved to uh, on chip photonics, which is called this is the chip X8 from Sanadu. Sorry, it's not X8, it's X, um, no, the qubit is uh, X, X8, but the, they have uh, the, the most advanced system they have is called X24 and it supports. Um, 24 modes, and these are chip modules that you can see is like as big as your fingerprint. And the good part of this is like these two systems are equivalent. So all this, this this huge optical table we have seen here on the left, it has been let's say put in a chip, and then this is the way you can compute. And of course, these chips are you can produce many of them in the fabrication facilities. All of them are the same, and then you just make tiles and then you combine all the tiles together. And then another similar company to Sanadu is Sci Quantum. Um, they haven't released any product yet, but it's also similar to Sanadu is silicon based uh, chip modules. They are going to be uh, roughly the same, the same, the same size. And they promise, they have promised that by, I think by 2024, they will have 1 million photonic qubits. So let's see if they can keep up to, to their promise. Another technology that in the last years uh, has shown a lot of potential is called neutral atoms. Neutral atoms, as I mentioned before, are very, very similar to uh, uh, ion traps, but uh, using optical tweezers that are called, um, you trap neutral atoms. And then this allows you to have a large number of qubits uh, they are the leading platform for quantum simulators. So there uh, you can arrange your qubits as, as you wish and make them interact, inter interact. But one of the drawbacks is that uh, no one has been able to demonstrate a complete gate set using this uh, qubit implementation. So this means you cannot do universe, you cannot do universal computation using neutral atoms. So this is basically how the setup looks like. You have a, cha a chamber. Then you have a grid, and then you have, um, let's say, in this chamber, you trap, you, you make a grid, and then with the uh, 3D optical tweezers, you can trap your neutral atoms at different positions. And actually, the the the, the level of uh, manipulation you can get here is is really impressive. So these are uh, physical images of how you can arrange the atoms in in this in these chambers. So actually here they make a torus with the atoms and uh, using 120 atoms and even they went further and they recreated the Eiffel Tower. So this is the degree of manipulation they, they can get with these 3D optical tweezers. It's, 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 it's really fine. They can make many structures. And there are uh, two companies that are leading the way. One is called uh, QERA um, that they have uh, 
a 200 atom simulator and then another one which is called pascal that they have a 256 atom simulator so this i mean they have present re results and this is great for simulating uh, simulating physics because that is also other of the application of quantum computers you can simulate a physical system without having the actual physical system at the quantum level but um it has a lot of potential. It still needs to improve the also the error rates, and the most important is to to be able to demonstrate a complete gate set. Otherwise, you cannot do universal one universal computation. And then let's move um, uh, finally to silicon spin qubits, which is other of the let's say of the of about the last two years. They have made a lot of progress. They have a, a small footprint because they occupy roughly 100 nanometers, they are very, very small. They are uh, compatible with the semiconductor industry. This means that um, you, the tools used to make regular uh, processors for standard computers, uh, you just can change the, re you just literally change the recipes and then you can make a uh, quantum processor based on spin qubits, but the fidelities still need to improve. So basically this is how uh, uh, silicon spin quantum pro spin qubit quantum processor looks like. <clears throat> you have a silicon substrate, and then you have uh, this. Let's say these sticks you see there are the are the electrodes. That what they do is they create a quantum dot. In this case, they create two quantum dots, and each quantum dot is a qubit. And then you can make these two quantum dots interact and, and perform calculations. So this is another implementation how this look this looks like is is totally it's, it's, as before as you have a chip and then you zoom it really in the chip you have uh, these gates and electrodes that define the the quantum dots then uh, the quantum processors available here are really really let's say small you have qtech in the netherlands they have two qubits and they have a 0.5 percent error rate in the two qubit gates and then you have um also, University of Sydney, that they have three qubits and they have a 0 0.6 error rate. So um, many people from the that works in the superconduct in the um, semiconductor industry, they look forward this impl the, to implement these uh, systems. But um, I think, uh, like in several years, they 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 are going to be very promising, and I hope they are. I mean, they grow in size and so on. The reason why they are still they they say so lagging so much behind compared to superconducting qubits is basically basically the fabrication the fabric the, the difficulty in fabrication um, as i mentioned before uh, it was very recently that the, the superconducting uh, well, quantum computing moved from the lab from the university labs to industry the tools that you have in an university lab are not precise enough to make these devices. This means that the, before, when they were trying to make this in the universities, the yield they were high, they were getting were very very small. If they make, uh, let's say, and they were making um, 100 samples, maybe 10 were working. On the contrary, if you could take superconducting qubits because they are larger. If you make 100 samples, all of them work. <clears throat> so it's it it has it has not it, it has not been until this technology has been taken to the big uh, fa manufacturing facilities like for example we have an image where we have the, the tools that are very very precise and we can this this is not it's a challenge to make but it's not as difficult as uh, in the university labs so i think yeah in, in a couple in three four years they are gonna they're gonna make quite some um, news because also the benefit since these are so small um scalability is not a problem you can make a thousand easily or a million easily you don't need to think about okay how do i arrange million qubits in my system <clears throat> so now let's move to a final part of the talk and it's to talk a little bit about fault tolerant quantum computing because uh, i think i insisted that a lot during the talk uh, that is the goal um, of quantum computing um, nowadays we can see a lot of headlines saying like okay we have this system and this other system uh, 100 qubits and so on. The, I mean, it's very nice to progress, but the goal, the interesting uh, 
results and the, the revolution will come when we have fault tolerant quantum computing. This is a this is the part where is the breakthrough where we have the algorithms that are going to change uh, uh, yeah, our life, basically. So that is every time you design uh, or you want, to you want to design or improve a quantum computer, you need to have in, in mind that your goal has to be fault tolerant on the computation. <clears throat> so basically, the idea <clears throat> that we that is out there is basically we need to encode a logical qubit, a log, log, sorry, a logical qubit using several physical qubits. And there are mathematical theorem, theorems proven, proving that the, the logical qubit rate can be made arbitrarily small. This means like if I have enough physical qubits, I can make the error rates in my quantum processor as small as I want. So let's say <clears throat> if I want to have a a logical qubit error rates of uh, this is small. The physical qubit error rates, at least they need to be in this range, 0 0.1, 1%. If they are not smaller than this, I cannot start implementing a quantum error correction. It will not work simply. So I need to first, I need to make sure my system, the errors in my system are this small, between the, the smaller the better in general, but let's say between 0 0.1 and 1. And once I get that in my physical qubits, I can start implementing a, a for, um, error correcting codes. Otherwise, until you don't get this, don't even think about it because simply mathematically it doesn't work. So one of example of the examples of one of the <clears throat> one code to implement the logical qubit is the short code store apart from being famous for inventing the the short uh, algorithm. He also was a revolutionary because he invented the first uh, error correcting code. Uh, so basically, it's a simple code that it uses nine um, nine qubits uh, to uh, yeah. It uses nine qubits to implement. Uh, sorry, one two. Yeah. It uses nine qubits to implement one logical qubit. So you need to have all these states. You <coughs> you have enough. Uh, you have enough physical qubits and then taking together all these physical qubits, you make them interact and you make a, let's say a, a small a software that allows you to implement a logical qubit. And this logical qubit is protected against error because if one of these uh, qubits suffers an error, the, this code guarantees that you can detect and correct for the error. So basically this is how you, you arrange uh, the things. Then that's to, to make an example how uh, this sample of the surface code. So imagine in the picture what you see are a cube are auxiliary qubits that you will use for checking if the data qubit they have errors. So just to, to give you some estimations for the one of the most famous cor error correcting codes, which is the surface code. <clears throat> there, if we assume an error threshold of this 0.51%, then we need between 1,000 and 10,000 qubits to implement only one logical qubit. Of course, this depends on the error model or on the, how the errors behaves in our system. And to put it more into context, uh, for instance, um, we want to factorize uh, a 2048 bits number. We need uh, 20 million qubits, basically, and eight hours. And then this this assumes for for making these calculations, uh, we are assuming that the surface code cycle is one microseconds. So this means like every every step of the of the of the calculation, I Check for, error, check for the errors and correct for the errors in one microsecond or less. And that all my data qubits, they have a qubit error rate of 0 0.1 or less. And also there is a model, but the, the, the errors need to be random and independent from each other. So the, if this qubit here in white has an error, the error has to be independent of the, all the other errors in the system. So you can see 
this puts in perspective uh, how far we are from implementing like the famous and uh, most useful uh, software or uh, yeah, or programs algorithms that give us a real real value and something that everyone will agree is is useful so it's for we are talking about 20 20 million physical qubits and so far the record for supercomputing qubits is 127 so there is st still still a long way to go but still we are uh, moving forward because Already we have implementations of fault tolerant uh, and error corrected qubits. Th these are just example of three papers of written papers. You can see, for example, well, <clears throat> this one is, um, is from 2020. No, was no, sorry, published online on la October last year. This is a month ago exactly. This one, and then also this is from this uh, last Christmas. <clears throat> so we are moving already into um into a moment where we are able to impl start implementing error correcting code error correcting codes and and do and do error correction <clears throat> in our systems of course this is almost nothing because we are um, correct error correcting like maybe two qubits or three qubits or uh, you use for instance in the case of this paper in the middle they use um, they use 17 qubits I, I think it's 17 qubits no, they they use 10 qubits <coughs> to make one logical qubit. And here in this other paper, they use 17 physical qubits to make one logical qubit. But it's only one logical qubit, and still, the if you check this paper, the error rates of these logical qubits are still high. It's in the in the in the order of like 0.01 percent. So the, their their error rates are improved compared to the physical qubits, but still, is a huge error. And in, in this regarding which system is taking the lead in error correction is clearly ion traps. They have they have been able to implement more uh, error correcting codes, and this is only due to the connectivity they have, since they can um, have all to all connectivity. It's easier to implement error correcting codes, and the requirements for error correcting error correction are less strict than compared to superconducting qubits. And with this, I would like to, to finish the presentation. Thanks uh, a lot for your attention. And if, if you have any questions, I will, I will be very happy to, to answer them. OK, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. So first of all, uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I think there are a few of them, actually. So uh, while that happens. I'm going to share with you uh, the link for the next talk so that if anyone uh, wants to join or anything, uh, you can do it through that link. And let's see what questions do we have. So um, we have one from JD. Uh, I'm sure we have already addressed that, but maybe we can go quickly over that again. So mm -hmm. what is the material use he's asking uh, for the ion trap quantum computers? Yeah, for so, uh, for so for the ion traps, uh, I didn't put. Uh, I think I, I haven't specified the mat the materials, but typically, um, you, when you have these on chip traps, they use uh, copper and silver and gold. These are the materials, so it's not uh, nothing fancy. You can just you need to make electrodes that uh, to make uh, uh, yeah these traps these. Uh, you need to use materials that are, are, are conductors and to be able to, to manipulate the, the RF signal you send. So it's this, I think this one, they have gold and gold, copper and silver, probably. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Um, so I don't know if there are any other questions. Uh, we have a comment from Tomas. The ions are high enough about that uh, the material matters less than for the other qubit uh, realizations. In, in, in which, sorry? In, uh, no, in ion trap. Yeah, it was just a comment, I think. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, the mat indeed, the material doesn't here doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Great. It matters for the control, but uh, it's not as it's not as important as in superconducting qubits or spin qubits, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we have a question that I'm sure is related to this: uh, whether uh, is silicon used for ion trapping? um maybe some because these ion traps also they have different layers 
so at some layer you use the you need to use silicon as a support uh but it's not uh, it's not uh it's not as in in silicon spin qubits that uh, you pattern silicon directly or in 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 superconducting qubits so there there will i'm sure there will be some because if you open the this sil uh, ion trap chips they have like four or five uh, um, levels and it's in some of them i am sure they will use it but it's not uh, it's not important it's at the end you need to make a metal trap with the electrodes and the shapes and for 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 spin silicon qubits and for superconducting qubits yeah, silicon is is the only way to do it okay thanks so i don't know if there's anything else from anyone uh, i was just wondering the on the subject of error correcting codes uh, is it possible to apply error correcting codes to logical or so-called logical qubits? So you could take physical qubits, apply an error correcting code, say take 10 or whatever ratio to construct one uh, qubit, whatever you want to call it, and then take 10 of those. So if you start with 100 physical qubits and then you do error correcting codes to create uh, 10 qubits, second order qubits from those qubits. And then you put an error correcting code on top of those 10 to make a uh, error correcting qubit. Do you see the same? Is it like a, um, does, does it have a power scaling where the, the, if you were to, well, assuming this, this scheme could be implemented, would you expect to see a power scaling where if you d drop the number of qubits by two orders of magnitude, you'd expect the errors to also drop by two orders of magnitude? So the, the, the scale, so what you, what you, what you have said, yeah, you can totally do it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's feasible. The problem is like, um, you need, so I don't know if it is scale linear. So no, if it is scale, it will, it will scale exponential because if right now the estimations we have are like a thousand qubits for one, so a thousand for one, um, of course you need to see your logical qubit, what your, your logical qubit, what is the error rate of that logical qubit? And based on the on that error rate, you can estimate what would be the error, the the number of qubits needed to put more layers. But I think the, the scaling will be exponential in the at the in the name in the number of physical qubits. Also, there is when you implement error corrections, there is something which is called magic state distillation and lattice surgery is for me it's incredibly complicated the, the, all the things you need to do so i think if you manage to apply one layer of logical qubits it will be you will be happy right okay i was just wondering because uh, there's sort of when it comes to scalability there's always a trade-off it seems between speed uh, and number of kind of qubits and, and the quality and one thing i was wondering about was uh, ion q recently announced a quantum volume of over 4 million, which mm -hmm. I thought was quite fantastic because it forced IBM to redefine a new metric, uh, which is CLOPS, which takes into account speed because they, they're no longer competitive on their own metric. Um, but then I was wondering how can they achieve, because you said they had uh, one qubit error rates of 1% and two qubit error rates of 2%, uh, which is considerably higher than anything other than neutral atoms. So how is it they were able to achieve this quantum volume of 4 million with, while having such high error rates? Yeah, so, um, I mean, they, they announced 4 million quantum volume, but they haven't proven. So this is an estimation they did based on the, the test devices they have in their lab. So we don't have public data that anyone can check whether this is true or not. Uh, they just made estimations because, of course, the systems they make available for the public are not the, the same system they are testing in the lab now. And the other thing is, like, when you have uh, ion traps, um, the error codes you can implement are much more efficient than the uh, error codes you can implement in for superconducting qubits. So, uh, for instance, with um, uh, there, are, I, I think it's called bin. Uh, it's bacon sort codes or uh, something like this. And then you have with 16 qubits, it's enough to make one logical qubit. So um, they, there is this 4 million, 4 million thing they have, I mean, it's something they have promised, but there is, they haven't so evidence that they have achieved this. And probably they are delaying it because they are not able to uh, lower the error gates 
the error rates they 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 have because they they typically when you make your roadmap you say okay i i expect in two years and one year to be here of course you can be wrong for whatever complication and it has been already a while since they announced this for million quantum volume and still there is there is nothing so far the record in quantum volume um honeywell has it and it's 1024 with the h1 system I'll see if anyone else has a question because I have I think three more written down. <laughs> uh, there's another one from Yadid. I think it's related to to this. Is there any generic rule or relation between physical qubits and logical qubits in terms of in terms of uh, how many logical qubits would you need uh, for any number of physical qubits? So how does this this scale? So this scales depend again in the error correcting code you are implemented. Uh, implementing and the uh, and also uh, is several variables so first you need to the type of code you implement and the error rates of your physical qubits the lower the error rates in your physical qubits the the less physical qubits you need to implement one logical qubits the estimation i have shown are assuming that your the error rates of your physical qubits are 0 0.1 percent so let's say it's more or less the threshold where we are moving right now with the system we currently have. So that's why, but of course it's in 10 years, if somehow we manage to make like, uh, yeah, the error rates are 0 0.0001. Yeah, we will need maybe 10, or, but this is um, in the, there are several, several variables you need to, you need, you need to take into account to, to, so there is no a general formula for everything you need to first select your error correcting code and the error rate of your physical qubit. And based with, the, with this information, you can estimate how many Q, physical qubits you need for one logical qubit. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. No problem. So I had one myself, is just to know your, your thoughts on this. So are, you, are we considering the error rates that can be introduced by the gates uh, that we are using to implement the error codes? So the, the quantum error correction uh, correcting codes. So we use gates uh, to, to convert one uh, logical qubit into shallow physical qubits, but that operation itself, does that introduce more errors or can do? Uh, do you mean the code for generating the logical qubits? Mm -hmm. hmm, good question. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know, actually. I, th I think it doesn't because, hmm, I don't know. Because what? You must yes, do must do, to think about. Mm -hmm. I need to think about. Yeah, I, I, I don't know actually. I cannot answer. So I will check. That's a good question. That's fine. Uh, I think it does allow more. for errors made because uh, you you. Uh, I don't know exactly how the error correcting codes. I'm not an expert on this myself either, but I do believe there is uh, at least some leeway uh, for errors to be made because otherwise it would be impossible to do. Uh, error correction but the the thing that you said earlier about the fact that the errors can't be correlated because that would prevent you from being able to do it so you can have errors as long as they're independent is what you said and i think that's the case okay do you do any of you have any other questions maybe thomas do you have a few you were saying Oh, nice. Okay. Well, if I can uh, go again. Um, so one thing that I find quite interesting when you consider applications of quantum computing from the hardware level all the way to the algorithms and end user side, uh, I wonder if, because no one has got on a, well, a lot of people seem to be quite agnostic about which is going to be the dominant platform for quantum computing. And some people have gone and suggested that there are some platforms which may be better suited for certain applications. Uh, and I was quite interested because you mentioned Xanadu and Xanadu are one of the leaders in the field of quantum machine learning from a software perspective. So I was wondering perhaps if you thought that some of the architectures you discussed might be better suited because of the trade-offs in, in their advantages and disadvantages for particular applications. So you could think of a quantum processor like a GPU in that sense where you, you optimize it to do different things. Yeah, so... <clears throat> There are, there, it's the case, there are, there are also companies that what they do is called co-design. Mm -hmm. So they, they design quantum processors specifically based on the target applications. 
So it, 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 let's say, let's say for instance, if they think they're going to have a lot of clients that are going to are going to use vari uh, variational algorithms, they make the architecture and everything based on the optimum thing for uh, for solving vari variational algorithms. The problem, for at least the, the way I see it, the pro for machine learning uh, and Sanadu, um, I don't think there is, uh, for classical machine learning, since you need to input the data, classical data, loading classical data in a quantum computer is extremely expensive resource-wise. So uh, if it's if you are talking that you can generate quantum data and you manipulate that with quantum machine learning, uh, yeah. I think uh, it's, it's promising. But if we, what we are talking right now here is only classical machine learning, uh, the overhead in loading the data is going to be humongous. I suppose. But, in, oh, in, sorry. but the, there is indeed uh, the, the bigger companies are, are targeting like uh, yeah, universal computation, but there are some other like smaller companies that, in order to get the resources, get the funding. They are targeting uh, specific applications. Uh, for instance, I think also D-Wave now are before they were doing adiabatic quantum computing, but it's still a controversy if they were using really quantum properties or not. Uh, now they are moving. They are moving to the quantum uh, gate-based model, and then they, uh, they are already um, focused on optimization and uh, variation, variation and adiabatic yeah, optimization. So I guess the gate the architectures they will choose and the type of gates they will try to implement are the ones that are mostly used for variational algorithms or optimization algorithms. And uh, to, to ask about the sort of, again, sticking with photonics, uh, I was wondering how do you implement uh, efficiently a two qubit gate on a photonic processing unit? Because it seems quite difficult to do. Yeah, that uh, yeah, I need to. I I was reading the other day about the because they use this cluster state model. So the way you implement it is not. You need to first you need to like create entanglement, and then you need to measure in a certain pattern. So it's a. Uh, I I don't know all the details, but it's not uh, it's not like in it's not like in uh, in. in all the other uh, architectures that use the gate-based model. So it's more, it's more that you need to you need to mix the things in a in a certain way, such as the end results is the the let's say the two qubit gate uh, the two qubit gate. But the the, the problem also with uh, photonics now is that the um, I think the efficiency to implement things like entanglement and so on is quite low. Still, it's like fifty percent efficiency when you want to implement something that. As entanglement. So uh, that is, um, uh, it, I mean, it sounds photonic, it sounds really on paper, it sounds great. Room temperature, uh, photons, they don't interact with anything. But then when you want to ap apply the gates and the calculations, you need, to, I mean, and the way you need to compute, that is, uh, I think, uh, the efficiencies there are going to be, they, need, they are going to, they will need to show up a lot of things. Yeah, because I what one of the things I heard from Psy Quantum was that they were going with a uh, for their uh, they systems the, they need cryogenics. Yeah, uh, but uh, the the thing with cryogenic in photonics is only for the um, for the detectors. Yeah. So it's not the whole system. So, but every every system every, I mean, if you use silicon chip mm. like Psy Quantum and Sanadu. Uh, the detectors are called single photon detectors, and those detectors they are able to when you whenever a, a single photon hits the detector you can detect it, and this is because those are based on superconducting materials and superconducting materials they don't work if you don't cool them down. But it's like the only part of the setup which is at in in, in the cryostat. The rest you can have it at room temperature. Okay. Okay. So the only thing at the end what you do is you you link your optical system. You link it to the superconductor to the to the detector with the optical fiber. Okay. Well, you you've managed to get through all of my questions. Yeah. Go ahead. Janil, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Uh, Qtech is using uh, entanglement as an advantage for uh, transmitting qubits between quantum processes. Hmm? Have you heard about this? Which command? Qtech? Yeah, Qtech, Netherlands. Uh, but uh, no, but the, which is because the the only the, so far the only implementation of uh, connecting two quantum processors I know is from ETA in Zurich that they have two the quantum uh, two dilution refrigerators and they are they, they have connected it, but this QTEC I don't know what, how they are doing. Okay, fine, because uh, entanglement we have seen entanglement as disadvantage, but. Uh, most of the companies are using entanglement uh, for uh, uh, different uh, processes, quantum processes um, for building uh, quantum networks. Yeah, I see. Okay, so, okay. but maybe, like, so, so maybe, yeah, if the, those are in, in like it's related to quantum communications that I don't know how uh, the field, so it's called, yeah, the people building quantum networks, the things they do and the, the way they operate is slightly different to quantum computing. So the, um, from that field, I don't know that much. Okay, fine, thank you. Okay, anything else from anyone? <clears throat> Otherwise, the next session will start in five minutes, so we still have a few minutes left. Okay, I think we can we can close it for now. So thank you everyone for joining again, and thank you especially Daniel for for your effort and, and sharing your experience with us. So we okay. hope to see you all in in future sessions. Thank you again and uh, have a nice day. Thanks guys. See you next time.